I'm Terry Scott, Executive Director of B-17 Alliance Foundation, and we are here today at the Oregon Veterans Care Center in Lebanon, Oregon, and we are interviewing veterans. This could be the beginning of a long-term relationship, and we're very excited. I had the privilege of interviewing a gentleman from World War II this morning that you're going to hear about later. He wonderful stories. What a sweetheart of a man. A woman who served from 58 to 61, who has information about veterans and how women were treated in the Marines and how women in general are viewed from society. We need to remember our women veterans as well. So we're about to go to another room and see Mr. Ellis and he's a World War II veteran. We're very excited about this and we want to share these stories with you so you learn from the horse's mouth the history of our veterans. Thank you for being part of it and we look forward to sharing with you many stories in the future. Uh, so you're Greg Pierce? I are. You are? Great. I just need your signature right here, Greg. This just tells me that I can videotape you and that your family can't sue me later for it. <laughs> So we are going to videotape you, and we're just videotaping all kinds of veterans, seeing what they have okay. to say. You smell good. Axe. Axe? Oh, that's why I like it. I like that one. My son wears it, too. Axe gold, as a matter of fact. Ooh. Okay, so, you know Mike. Mike and I go back a ways. I met Mike. That's what he said. I, I, I'm a singer, and I actually sang for the ODVA a lot. And then at, through that, he knew my brother, who was a baseball player, mm -hmm. and um, started sending me pictures about my brother. And then we just sort of, he likes to prove Connected. my stuff, because I can't write very well, but I write a lot. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm going to leave that alone. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so tell me, what, what was your military service? Well, I was in two branches. I was in the Navy as a corpsman, and I was in the Marine Corps as a combat medic. Combat medic. Yeah. That's pretty exciting stuff, I bet. It was a lot of fun. I had a good time. Did you? Yeah. Did you bring home any souvenirs? Huh? Did you bring home any souvenirs? Brought a, brought a trophy home. This? No. This. Ah. That was your souvenir. Yeah. Hmm. I got there on November 22nd. I was home by Christmas. Really? Serious. That's only a month. Not quite. What theater were you in? Where were you, where were you at? Vietnam. Just outside of Da Nang. A little town called Phan Bac. I was with uh, the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Because they get all their medical personnel uh, through the Navy. So we had our unit uh, there with... Uh, 3-3 three, three armor of the Fleet Marine Force, FMF. And uh, I got there one day. That night I was out on night patrol and I promptly fell asleep. Not a good idea to fall asleep. No. Well, they... They kind of understood, I guess, because I had just got in country and had been in the air for about 18 hours and trying to get uh, acclimated. But we heard about it, I heard about it the next morning. And the last item on the menu today is Doc found a nice place to fall asleep last night. I was a little tired. No. I stood up and said, yes, I did, but it will never happen again. That's because that's what the military does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they thought I was not going to be good to my word, 
So I was on night patrol for the next three weeks. Oh, a little punishment there? No. No? Nope. Trust. Oh. To see if I was good to my word. Interesting. That's how the military does it, right? Yeah. Uh huh. So then did you gain their trust? Yeah. Good. And then what happened? I got shot. December 11th, 1966. I was 19. Just turned 19, as a matter of fact, in September. And uh, while I was there, I had a good time. I uh, met the valley, village uh, blacksmith. Had a good time with him and his family. Mm -hmm. And then everybody worked. I mean, from the, from the little kids, the babies, they run around all day. All they had to do was bring something in and throw it in the fire. Wood. You mean? Wood, a mm -hmm. stick, a rock, a, anything. That was their job. Survival. Everybody worked. Mm -hmm. Grandma was sitting over in the corner on a pair of bamboo slats about oh, four feet off the ground working the bellows for the coke fire for the making of uh, rakes and hoes and knives to work in a rice paddy. Uh, so the bellows, you're talking about this thing? This thing. Oh, okay. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of side to side, it's up and down. Okay. And she sat there very happy, chewing on her betel nut, black teeth and all. And most everybody that's been to Vietnam has, all, has seen that already, knows what it's from. Mm -hmm. So I had a good time there. That sounds like you had a cultural experience. I did have. Mm -hmm. It's only been in the last oh, nine or ten years I wanted to go back and see who survived. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the guys from World War II did that. Have mm -hmm. the Vietnam guys done that too? A lot, as far as I know, a lot of them have. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably a good experience, you know, you see yeah. there was good that happened because of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there was. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't there long enough to see much of what we did. So would you enlist again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty honorable. Very honorable. But I think this time... I would probably uh, go into the Air Force and become PJ. What's PJ? They're pararescue mm -hmm. for the Air Force. Gotcha. They drop them into everything. Water, sand, jungle, doesn't make a difference. Well, that's pretty adventurous. Very. Wow. you got to go in prepared to defend yourself, to defend your patient or client. I heard of one instance where one guy had to parachute out over the ocean late at night to a submarine so he could do an appendectomy. Wow. That was a long time ago, so. Mm -hmm. And lately I haven't been paying attention, so. Mm -hmm. hmm. Had a question. One ear out the other? Right, I need to write those questions down because I'm listening and then I forget when it's time to talk. Okay. What was the question? The question is, you are going, you would you would enlist again. Yeah. So, um, wait, how did you get into the military? What happened there? Why did it go in? Go yeah, in? why did you go in? What inspired you? <clears throat> Well, my father was a medic in World War II. He was a surgical assistant. And he ended up in Europe through Africa. They came in through Morocco and up into Libya, I think it was, and then up into Sicily and then into Rome. And I've only seen some pictures I wouldn't recognize them anymore. And uh, uh, 
when uh, I was growing up, I saw a book that he had, and it was about World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw a picture of him with a caduceus on his arm, asked him what that was, and he said that was for being uh, a medic, and I said, okay, well, that's all. To myself, I said, all right, that's okay, I'll do that. So when I graduated high school, I spent the summer, most of the summer, uh, working in a cannery graveyard, mm -hmm. which helped. And uh, Helped because it preened you for staying up all the time? Yes. Because <laughs> I usually didn't go to bed. Uh, Till one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh huh. <laughs> and you're 17. You could give a rat. Half. You What's had a lot of energy of at 17. You're just gonna go and go and go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the youngest ones in our class to graduate. And uh, I told my mom and dad what I wanted to do. And dad and I went in. Shortly thereafter, uh, towards the end of August, and enlisted. And I enlisted for three years. I could have enlisted for four, but I enlisted for three. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first day at boot camp was my 18th birthday. And that was on November 22nd? Or no, that would have no. been when you went over. That was when I went over. Mm -hmm. September 3rd was my first day in boot camp, 1966. Nineteen sixty-five. excuse me. Mm -hmm. 1965. Yep. What did you do when you came home? Well, for the first three years, uh, I was in Long Beach, California, at uh, the VA center down there, Spinal Cord Center. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a, a doctor I'm glad I met. He was chief of uh, spinal cord injury for at least the western half of the United States. At that time, Long Beach was... Uh, the only spinal cord center west of the Mississippi. Wow. Yeah. His name was Dr. Bors, Ernest Bors. I keep wanting to put the Ernest T in there, you know, from Andy Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> and the T would have fit. Uh huh. So how did, how was it getting through those first years coming back? A little rough. Yeah. Yeah. First three years, I spent the first 18 months on my stomach due to a, a bed sore that I got from laying on a bedpan in Vietnam. Oh. Laying flat. Waiting for help? No. Uh, just had been put on there, and they got busy. Um, they had a, a company... Uh, roll into a Vietnamese, Vietnamese ambush. And these guys, one guy next to me, I heard him bleed out because they couldn't plug the holes fast enough. I mean, he had so many holes in him. And a couple others I heard, uh, One across the way, one more down there. I was surprised I heard him though. And then uh, I was there for at least three weeks. And I got back here on Chris Christmas Eve, 1966. 
Was your family there for you? Oh, they got they got to see me up in Bremerton before I went down to Long Beach. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they came up. Good. So did both grandparents. Nice. And uh, after three months in Bremerton, and then I went down to Long Beach. It was all right. Mm -hmm. You were there for three years. Yeah. Uh, met a lady down there who was still a friend after 53 years. That's great. That's good. Was she a nurse or something or what? No. Mm -hmm. She was going through to see somebody else in another ward. And I said something and she thought I was talking to her something. I don't know. Don't remember. And she came over to me, started talking. And things went from there. Hmm. Just a long time friend then. A long time friend. That's awesome. Big sister, more like. That's great. Yeah. She lives down in uh, Roseburg. Hmm. Do you get to see her sometimes? No. No. Just talk? Yeah, on the phone. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. She can't drive, and neither can I anymore. <laughs> They took my driver's license, <laughs> and I agreed with why they took it. So, so if you were going to ask, tell tell the world something they needed to know about Vietnam, what would you tell them? I have no idea. <laughs> That's honesty. I have no idea. <laughs> That's good. I was not there long enough to really make that kind of decision. Uh huh. I have spoken to Vietnam citizens. Mm -hmm. And they said they're alive today because Americans were there. So that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But that's all I can say about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think is significant about the area you served in? Well, it was outside of outside of Da Nang. It was with a tank battalion and um, an on on toast company which is uh, 105 rifle mm -hmm. company they put six of them on a on a uh, wheeled vehicle and three guys and they shoot 105 rounds very fast very good too probably very good mm-hmm uh, we had a Arvin training camp a mile across uh, ravine that we knew was half full of VC, maybe full. I don't know. Mm -hmm. VC Viet Cong. Viet Cong, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a slang? Huh? Is that a slang? VC? Mm-hmm. No. No. It stands for Viet Cong. Mm -hmm. It's what they go by, right? It's what they go mm -hmm. by. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have no reason to doubt it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the language well enough to what it means. Mm -hmm. So when you came back, were you able to do a job when you came back? Uh, not for a while. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, with the state of Oregon for a while as a typist for uh, the uh, sanction section for workman's compensation. Mm -hmm. We typed up the violations for businesses and uh, I did that for a good year and a half. Got to type 180 words a minute. Very good, wow. That's I don't know many guys that can do that. No, I don't know many people that can do that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> and then uh, a job came up over at SAFE. And I was there for almost six months. And uh, the uh, supervisor came in because I was working in the permanent total injury department and uh, paid bills and 
took in new new clients, mm-hmm. that type of thing. People who were injured? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If they had a neck or a back injury, I sent it down for investigation. And set up doctor's appointments, whatever it took. Mm-hmm. And uh, three days before my six-month probationary period was up, the supervisor came in and said, oh, we will accept your resignation because your phone calls and form letters aren't up to par. And I went, wait a minute. Phone calls and form letters. Okay, I'm not nasty on the phone. And you can't really screw up a form letter, can you? Mm-mm. Okay. And at that point I was so mad, I said, all right, I wrote, I quit, and threw it on his desk. And that was the end of that? That was the end of that. Mm-hmm. Since then, I really haven't what you would call worked. I, I'm a gun collector. Okay, that's good. Mm-hmm. Guns and knives. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the part of my collection that I am most proud of is that I have a weapon from every war period in the United States. Wow. From the Civil War on. Really? Yes. Clear up until today. Have you? How long have you lived here? In Oregon? Yeah. I was born here in Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Over here on uh, 2nd Street, or 5th. Second Street over there. It's now a Boys and Girls Club. Hmm. And that used to be a hospital. And me and my brother were born there. I think my mother was too, but I'm not sure. Uh, And uh, we lived here uh, until the middle 50s. Uh, my sister was born across the street over here. And we lived behind Grandpa and Grandma's house out on West Grant Street, mm-hmm. just down from Green Acre School. The house is still there, but the house that Green we lived in... Green Acres, it's the place to be. Exactly. <laughs> well, we didn't have any pigs over in that area. That time. <laughs> Cows, yes. Those cow patties were home plate. Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand that. They go, (laughs) what? I've had uh, cow patty toss contests before. So have I. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you can throw it the farthest. (laughs) And you better hope they pick a dry one for you. Yeah. (laughs) That's a lot of fun, actually. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there were six of us Mm -hmm. in our neighborhood. The girl across the street, uh, Diane, I think her name was. Uh, Me, Steve, the kid next door, and another kid down the street, Fred, that uh, we all got together and played softball out in the cow pasture. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to use first for home plate? Uh, Cow pie. Cow pie is a nice one. It's a nice, great shape. Yeah, it is. (laughs) And what do you use for second base? The cow pie. Exactly. (laughs) So you'd run the diamond and you had to touch second base. Didn't have to worry about first and third. But you had to touch home plate. That's funny. Well, it got funnier, especially if it was a fresh one. (laughs) True story. We interviewed the gentleman named Ellis first this morning. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's from World War II. And his uh, military reunion book is called News from News from the po- Poop Poop from the Group. Poop from there the Group. <laughs> I thought that was great. That is a great thing. <laughs> poop from the Group. <laughs> oh, that's great. So I was recently... Um, Visiting with the Native American group that's down in Jefferson. They have a museum down there. 
Mm -hmm. And one of the words they use to talk about their military service personnel are, he used the word warrior. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me in the head, warrior. I think that as a, because I'm not military, I never could serve. I respect the veterans because you go to a place that I could never go. And when you use the word warrior, it made a lot of sense to me. What do you think about that? Well, you have to be a fighter to go there. You have to be willing to put your life on the line so that your tribe can live. To protect your family. Mm -hmm. Or your country. Or your country. Mm -hmm. Or, or it, it, in a quote unquote, in the future, if it comes down to it, protect the world. Yeah. Right. I think it was a pretty deep word and helps, I think, society understand what our veterans did. And that's what we are trying to do here, right? Yeah. We're trying to help people understand why they should honor the sacrifices, what people did yeah. for their freedom. Yeah. So they can have freedom of speech. To stand up there and say, well, you can't do that. Right. Yeah. No, somebody protected that freedom in order yeah. for them to have it. True. So our military is very important. Yeah, and most of us would do it again. Every one of us, if you asked us. Mm -hmm. Takes a certain mentality to do that. Yeah. That's I was in. A, I went in to become a nurse. I did. I'm licensed, though. Because. But that's what the service is. That's what mm -hmm. the service is. Mm -hmm. We did everything on the ward that an LPN does. We started IVs. We started. We took blood. Gave medicine. Gave narcotic, mm -hmm. changed bandages, did all of that. Now, when you send your service, your military overseas, guess who's got to go with them? Doctors. Doctors, nurses, corpsmen, mm -hmm. medics, combat medics, whatever you want to call them. So, before you went into the service, did you have an education in medicine? I was, I was our team. Uh, trainer for the last two years of high school. Oh, <laughs> and what did you train them? Well, I wrapped their ankles, wrapped their knees, and I trained them to shut up when I told them to. <laughs> so for the athletes or for who? No, for the athletes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> shut up and just take it. <laughs> just sit there, shut up, let me do my job, or I'm going to screw it up bad enough where you're not going to be able to walk out there. <laughs> I so you're kind of a tough, like tough I'm, guy. You're a tough guy. Not back then, no. <laughs> when I had the upper hand, yeah. Because yeah. I also was an Eagle Scout. We, Very... ha we had a troop. Mm -hmm. One of my other best friends that I met in the 8th grade is a man called Tom Drynan. And when I met him, he was, I was in the eighth grade, and he was a state police officer for the state of Oregon, mm -hmm. and a game warden. And he came into class one day and says, I'm starting a, a Boy Scout troop and wanted to see if anybody in here would like to join. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I worked my way up, um, became a senior troop leader, uh, Eagle Scout, uh, managed the troop when we went to the 1964 National Jamboree. Mm -hmm. We had 15 people from Mill City and Detroit and Idina go, and 15 people from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, go. I was put in charge of that group. Nice. You're a leader. Yeah, we took a train trip across the top of the United States, all the way to Valley Fork, Pennsylvania. Visited everything on the way over. 
and on the way back. We were gone about a month. It was a nice train trip. I want to do it again. It was beautiful. I've rode the train before. It's gorgeous on the train. Yeah. You don't have to run in, worry about running into cars either. No, you just have to worry about nasty at... Never mind. <laughs> Conductors. <laughs> oh. So, do you want to tell us what happened? When? On the day that you got your souvenir? Are you up to it? Yeah, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Our uh, camp was on the far end uh, of a base. And we'd been machine gunned from outside uh, in the afternoon. And everybody was high on adrenaline. Some guys had been drinking, yeah, but that's not the same. Mm -hmm. And that night I had a uh, watch at the far end of the camp. And uh, went up there, got things set up, and looked around. Went up, sat on the tank for a little while, went down, looked inside, never been in one, and came back, and oh, about 8.30 or so that night, there was four of us in the tent. Uh, I was sitting uh, on the right side of the door as you come in getting ready for bed and there was a guy up in the upper left corner, upper right corner and we were just having a good time trying to relax and get rid of that mm -hmm. anxiety more than that right? yeah that icy cold spot in the middle of your stomach that doesn't go away just right away and uh, one guy came in, and we got to talking, and uh, he said, oh, look what I traded for, and he pulled out a 38, and he's a corporal in the Marine Corps, and you're not allowed, if you're enlisted, uh, you're not allowed to have a 38, 45, yes, 38, no. So like, can I ask why? It's when uh, do you have kids? If I, uh, ask? I have a 19 year old and a 23 and three grandchildren. Okay, what happens when you give a new cap gun for Christmas? What's the first thing they do? They shoot it like an idiot. Exactly. Uh huh. They pass it around, and the next day they run around the neighborhood going, "Yay! Look what I got." Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'll play that. Apply that same theory to eighteen or nineteen, twenty, and twenty-one year olds that it traded his forty-five for a thirty-eight and said, "Oh my, look what I got!" So we passed it around. We all went, mm, yeah, handed it back to him. And he's still laughing or giggling. I'm starting to lay down on the bed. And for some stupid reason, nobody knows. He went over and he put one round in a gun. And he spun the cylinder, slapped it shut, and went click to the guy up in the upper left corner. And we all stopped and we went, nah, this is not a game. Put the gun up, you're going to hurt somebody. And he's still laughing and giggling. And he spun the cylinder again and went, click, number two. Pointing at people? Pointing at people. Oh. Just like this. Excuse me, Dave. Just like that. And pulling the trigger. Oh, my God. Then he spun it again in the same corner. Well, I was starting to, we were starting to lay down when he did that. And all three of us jumped up and said, put the gun up, you're going to hurt somebody. 
Well, we all started to lay back down. And as I laid down, I saw him start to turn towards me. I wasn't fast enough. I was getting, starting to roll over, brush the gun out of the way. I wasn't fast enough. And he was about half the distance from me to Dave. And it went in my right shoulder, came out between T3, 4 in the back, severed spinal cord on the way through. I fell back, saying I'd been hit, and uh, the two guys up in the corners, they all, they went out that door so fast, and the guy that shot me threw the gun on the bed and he left. Because all of a sudden he woke up what he was doing. All of a sudden, he got outside and I, something hit him. I don't know what it was. But he came back inside. And at that point in time, I could see and hear everything. I heard the guy on the tank come down and say, I'll go get help. Well, they didn't think about the telephone. They were in a hurry to go get help. Mm -hmm. So he had to run about half a mile, I would imagine. So that took maybe three minutes. And then get help, have them come back at six minutes. In the meantime, the guy that shot me came back and is yelling that he didn't mean it, didn't mean it. It was an accident. And I said, I know. It's all right. We'll get it taken care of. What can I do? What can I do? I said, well, you get my unit one down there on the floor. You open the middle compartment. You pull out a big, big battle dressing. Break it open and hand it to me. And he did. And put it over this one. This hole. And then I told him, if that bullet went through... You roll me over, you put another pit, another battle dressing on that one, and you stop the bleeding in the back. Even if you have to put your finger in the hole. Well, he put a battle dressing on, and then he knelt behind me and rolled me back on his legs, so I'm laying it up against his, his stomach and chest. And uh, he's still saying that it was a mistake, it was a mistake. Yeah, I could feel that. And then, uh, about that time, uh, two of my superior enlisted guys came in, Higginbotham and Stewart. Mm -hmm. uh, Higginbotham was third class, Stewart was second class. And uh, when they came through the door, uh, I asked them if uh, I got the bleeding stop, and they said, yeah. And I don't know what they started doing then, because I passed out. Yeah. I don't think I passed out. I think I died at that point. And then the next thing I know, which was, I'm guessing, at least 10 minutes later. Because they had to go get a truck, bring it up, and take me back down to another unit that had a doctor. And I was laying there, and I woke up with uh, the doctor sitting on my chest with a cardiac needle in his hand that he'd already stabbed me with. And a friend that I went through boot camp with, through core school and Camp Pendleton with, he's standing over me breathe, with a bag, squeezing the bag, saying, breathe, breathe, and then he'd stop, and then he just slapped the dog crap out of me. You know, like, breathe now, breathe now. And it wasn't a gentle style. No. 
waking you up. They wanted oh, you. They wanted me away. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what woke me up. What woke me up was his tears falling on my face. Right through here. Love woke you up. Yes. Hmm. And then I was in and out. Uh, doctor said he wanted to dust off in four minutes. It was there in four minutes. And then another four minute ride back to uh, uh, Charlie Med in Da Nang. And woke up in uh, emergency. In and out. And if there's one guy I could ever get a hold of and find out who he was, I was in uh, x ray and I asked for a drink of water. You know what that dirty sucker gave me? Contrast. He had me drink a glass of that stupid ass chalky contrast. That was the last thing I had to drink for at least a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I spit that stuff out for every once in a while I still get it. <laughs> I would give him a whole quart and, <laughs> and hold him at gunpoint and say, you better drink this or I'm going to pull this drink. I've never forgiven you for this one. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is all on you, bud. <clears throat> and then I ended back up in uh, Travis. December 22nd, 1965. I was four. Hmm? I was four years old. Uh, Just so you I know. was 19. 19. Gosh. Long time ago. Yeah. I just celebrated the 54th year. Three days ago. Three days ago. Yeah. How about the guy that shot the gun? I would not say he came out all right. But for the next four days after I got shot and was down in Charlie Man, um, he was confined to uh, the doctor's or the commander's tent. Ow. I got a new grown hair in my nose and it hurts. I hate those. Oh. <laughs> Just found it this too. Is driving, this has been driving me nuts for the last three days. Oh. Anyway. Um, where was I? The guy that he, he didn't come oh, out well. He didn't come out well, no. Uh, he was confined to the commander's tent, his bunk, the latrine, and uh, the mess hall. And during that time, they were waiting to find out if I was going to live or die. And the word was passed down that if he was seen anywhere in camp, anywhere, without an escort. He was to be shot on sight and no questions asked. Bad choice. He made a bad choice. Sure he did. Mm -hmm. He made the bad choice when he traded that pistol. Yeah. However, when it found out uh, I was going to live, he got a bad conduct discharge 30 days in a Marine Corps brig in Vietnam. Not a nice place to be. And from all I've heard, not many people liked it there. No, he probably came out with some bad dreams. Very bad dreams. Very ugly dreams. And when he got out, they had already packed his uniforms and everything put him in a sea bag for him, esc escorted him to the front gate, threw the bag out, and him after it. Said, bye. Don't come back. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if he made it back from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You never talked to him again? Never saw him again. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Never heard anything about him again. Thought about it a couple of times, but... You seem like you've forgiven him. I did that night. Mm -hmm. Are you a believer? Of course. I got four of them standing right behind me. Mm -hmm. Three men, one woman. Mm -hmm. And she's right here. I've had a psychic tell me that. Really? And she won't tell me your name, damn it. <laughs> but she's watching you. She's your angel. All four of them have been there. That's yeah. awesome. I'm a believer too. I believe strongly that there is a God. Mm -hmm. and he is watching us, and he has angels that protect us. Yes. And what do you think you're supposed to get out of all this? I couldn't give you an idea. I have no... a life. Mm -hmm. You seem like you're really well put together. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. We all are. I have a 19-year-old. We talk about choices a lot. Mm -hmm. That guy with the gun, he made some, he made, you know, it's like when you're young. My son is 19. He's made some choices recently that have really affected his life. And we're learning from those choices. And we just keep saying, don't let them pull you down. You need yeah. to move forward, not backwards. Keep moving yeah. forward. This isn't who you are. This isn't who you have to be. If he's, if he's into drugs, you tell him, to stay on a drug. It's not the life for you. No. It will hurt you so fast. You will lose family. You will lose friends. You will lose your dog. Right. Your dog even. Mm hmm Understood. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. That was really deep. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Well, I don't... I just... I shouldn't I would say not, enjoy. Yeah, I know, right? I, I wouldn't even have expected it to be that story. You know? I expected it to be the enemy. And I think that's also educational. There's a lot of people who lose their life in the service who never went to war, only because yeah. they're trying to learn how to use a new gun or uh, whatever, yeah. protect the bombs or whatever. Something doesn't go right. Yeah. Any number of things. You don't have to be, you don't have to pick up a gun to be in the military. Yes, they give you a gun to use while you're in boot camp, so you know how to use one if you have to. Mm -hmm. So if you get sent overseas uh, to, okay, over in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, you better know how to use a gun. Whether you're a cook, a clerk, a medic, a doctor, a nurse, mm -hmm. uh, Somebody in, in the, uh, anybody in the food service, anybody in the uh, transportation, mm -hmm. even if it's just moving stretchers, you better know how to use a gun. Back here in the United States, maybe not. But you have been given an education that says you will learn how to use this type of gun. Mm -hmm. So if we need... If you need to, for some reason, you know how to use it. Right. Um, you know, everybody needs purpose, right? Yes. We all need purpose. And I think, um, for me right now, one of the reasons you were brought to this room today was so I can share your story. Because I'm going to use that story a lot. And there's a lot of ways I can use it for choices, for educating young people, for honoring the veterans in a, in a new way. Um, to appreciate the sacrifices made. There's a lot of ways I can use that story. And I want to thank you for sharing it. You're welcome. And so there, that was the purpose for today. You know, what is the purpose for today? That's really, that was a really strong purpose. Okay. Okay. Um, so I always like to end the interview with a question. We are restoring a B-17 bomber. I forgot to uh, give you a card. Did I give you a card? No, I... Got it. I'll give you one. So it's the gas station bomber. 
Yeah, so it's the gas station bomber. Yeah, Mike told me. And so we have it at Salem now. We are we are building a World War II museum, and we're going to fly that plane in honor of the World War II generation and all veterans. Where's the museum going to be? Well, right now it's in the hangar at the airport. So we're... There's another one over there, isn't there? I don't think so. I don't know. Um, Jimmy Young had one over there. Well, you're not thinking about Evergreen, are you? No, I'm thinking Salem Airport. Huh. Well, it's a historic airport, and there was World yes. War training there. Yes, I know. Mm hmm i got to give Jimmy a call and find, okay. find out. Have, oh, Jimmy Elton. Elting? Is it Elton? No, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Morgan. Hmm. Well, have him come visit me. So I, I haven't t talked to him since Boy Scouts. <laughs> and you were an eagle, too. Yes. <laughs> that's a big, that's an honor right there. So, yeah, it, it gives you a step up in uh, the military. Uh, they didn't recognize it when I went in. They did, but the people who were doing it, doing the interview, did not. Mm -hmm. They went, oh, Boy Scout. <laughs> no, Eagle Scout. Exactly. Uh-huh. No, it's a big deal. Yeah. So why would you think it's important for us to build that museum? and to educate a new generation to honor the sacrifices and the American spirit. To let them know what it costs, what it will cost to preserve that freedom that they have to protest, to do what they might think is right. Right. May not always work, but mm -hmm. there are people willing to sacrifice to say, okay, you have that right. It says so in our Constitution. Right. So how was it in Vietnam? Did they have those kind of rights? As far as I know, no. Yeah, there wasn't any of that stuff going on. They Still were just trying well, to survive. It's changed since back then. It's not north and south in mm -hmm. Vietnam. Do you have any questions for me? No, I'm fine. Okay, good. <laughs> Do you have any questions, Dave? No. All right, well, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. I really appreciate it very much. I'm going to give you a postcard. Hold on. So here's that gas station bomber. Yeah, I remember it. Mm hmm And then on the back side, I put a, a current card so you have to write where we're at information. Is that restaurant still open? The restaurant's in Milwaukee, and it is still open. Classic American Diner. My mother-in-law runs it. We may have so eaten there. Art Lacey right there and his wife. And, and you're telling me to look at these people without my knowledge. I know, right? <laughs> Art Lacey's no more, but we honor his story. He's the guy that brought the plane in. Yeah. There was another one out on a farm out towards Corvallis it was a bomber on the side of a hill. Somebody was using it for a Yeah, house. I heard about it, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it lately either. Mm -hmm. But I have seen it out there. These are pictures of us moving the airplane to Salem. All right. Anyway, I like to share that because it kind of lets you see who we are. Can put a, a history to the face. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm all just relaxed. <laughs> it's always educational for me because I'm not a history buff. I'm not a military brat. I'm, you know, and the only thing I learn is from interviewing the veterans. Well, I do, I do read. I'm not going to say I'm stupid or anything like that. And I do read, but I learn a lot from talking to veterans. And it's what's built my patriotism and my love of country. It really has. We are very well, fortunate to be Americans. For me, it was coming up, being a Boy Scout, going to a national jamboree. Finding out that uh, 
All Boy Scouts are not the same. <laughs> In Valley Forge, Pennsylvania back then, we had like 250,000 Boy Scouts. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> but you got to have room for tents, sections for archery, shooting, whatever. Uh, when we got there, the local Boy Scout troop had set, set up some local girls. And we were only allowed to bring back 25 bucks. Thank God. Because <laughs> you had to pay, pay, pay your money to the Boy Scouts. Uh -huh. And then they got busted about a week later. Oops. <laughs> so not all Boy Scouts are made the same. No. <laughs> Well, they were free enterprising, I will say uh -huh. that. There you go. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, good. So what's next? For me? Yeah. See if I can get this ulcer on my butt heel. And uh, I've been fighting it since... 2012. Wow. Hurt. I can't feel it. No. Oh. I'm paralyzed. Here oh, now. So feeling, st feeling stops here. Gotcha. So at least that's going for you, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Doesn't do well for my attitude sometimes. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's got to be hard. It is. Mm-hmm. We all have our little depression over whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Things start to catch up and you go... Right. Then we have to remember we're, that we're, we're not given more than we can handle. But sometimes we feel like we are. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what time is it? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Two o'clock? Mm-hmm. Well, I know Christmas is hard for you, but I hope you can look at the joy and the God who saved you and is there for you at all times. And that someday you will be renewed. I hope that you can see that. Am I out of line? No. But we'll see. Okay. I'll pray for you. And I know that's cliche, but I actually do pray. And when, you're my, when you pop into my head, and I remember today, I will pray for you. That's, yeah. how, I, that's how my brain works. Okay. Mm -hmm. And always God knows what you need, so I just tell him. And he figures it out. Well, somebody should. Right? <laughs> I got to go get off this. Do you, do you need help? Oh, no. Okay, you got it? I know how to drive. Ha! I'll get the door for you. Well, we'll probably be back, so you probably see us around here, All probably right. quarterly or something like that. All right. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll see you again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.